privilege to get an opportunity to introduce to you our today's guest speaker, Dr. Lisa Teeman. A ever smiling and soft spoken Lisa, it's my privilege. Dr. Lisa is Associate Professor, Department of Plant, Soil and Microbial Sciences, Michigan State University. Her work focuses on soil ecology and biogeochemistry, mechanisms of soil organic matter formation, and microbial controls on soil nitrogen cycling. Dr. Tiemann weaves soil organic matter dynamics and nitrogen cycling through a microbial lens, which helps us to understand soil organic matter formation, microbial community structure, biofilm formation, microbial productivity, and microbial growth efficiency. This emerging area of research provides a framework for testing questions about soil microbial community dynamics in relation to environmental change and important ecosystem services such as soil fertility and nitrogen cycling. Dr. Tiemann uses a combination of physical, biochemical, and genetic research techniques ranging from fundamental soil analysis to isotopic tracers to metagenomics in her exploration of questions related to soil biogeochemistry and ecology. Mechanisms controlling soil organic matter stability are directly related to soil resilience and sustainability in both natural and agricultural systems. Lisa uses principles of agroecology in her research with the objective of helping farmers all over the world develop innovative approaches to agriculture that simultaneously help increase productivity, resilience, and sustainability. She believes if we are to double worldwide food production in the coming decades, we must find new approaches to optimizing crop productivity. You are all in here to listen to a wonderful talk on Fundamental Principles of Soil Health, a Cornerstone of Agricultural Sustainability. Dr. Tiemann has a PhD degree from the University of Kansas in the subject Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and she did her postdoctoral research at University of New Hampshire. Here I present before you, Dr. Lisa. Over to you. I think microphone is cheap because it's the microphone is better. Yeah, because we can even Oh, okay. <laughs> Bring a mic. Thank you. All right. Okay. Test. Is this on? Okay. I hear some echoes, but I guess we're okay. So um, thank you all for being here today. It's, it's my privilege to be here. I really always enjoy my time. This is my third time here on campus, but this is the first time um, students have been here. Um, I was here once when school was out of session, and then the pandemic was just ending, and people weren't back yet. So this is great to see all of you here and to see the campus alive with, with all of the students. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here right now. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to do is I know a lot of you that are here today probably don't have a background in soils, maybe haven't thought all that much about soils. So I want to start just a little bit with a thought experiment as we start to talk about soil health. I want you to think a little bit about human health and think about if you were going to figure out who the healthiest person in this room is, how would you do that? Or how would you determine the person sitting next to you? How would you determine if they are healthy? What are the things that you would have to do? So think about that for a minute. Right, so things that come to mind, maybe you want to measure their blood pressure. Maybe you want to measure their heart rate. You want to measure cholesterol levels. Um, you want to figure out if they have any chronic conditions, if they have any diseases or illnesses, right? So we have a very specific list of things that we measure to figure out if somebody is healthy. 
But as you can also imagine, the things that you might measure or, or what might be wrong with the person sitting on your right may be completely different to the person sitting on your left. And when we think about soils, we have the same conundrum. There are no two people that are exactly alike. There's no two soils that are exactly alike. And so when we talk about measuring soil health, it's not really a measurable thing, okay? It's a metaphor, it's a concept. So when I say to you healthy soil or soil health, if you've never even thought about soils before in your life, you can at least have some idea what I'm talking about just intuitively. You understand what health is because you know what human health is, right? So are you gonna? My, my slides are not showing up here already. They're working on that? Okay, <laughs> they're still working on that. Okay, so well the first thing that I wanna do, the first slide is going to be a definition of soil health um, that is from the United Nations, from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, and there's some main points in that definition that I just, I wanted to highlight. But their definition talks about soil health as being um, a soil that is, has an active and diverse biotic community that provides symbiotic relationships with plants, um, that helps to uh, improve soil structure, uh, that basically helps to provide nutrients in support of plant growth, and that is the, the primary definition that I wanted to start with. And from that point on, I, I have some pictures <laughs> that we need to see, so let me uh, see if we can get this switched over. All right, well, while we're waiting, just for my own benefit, um, who here um, comes from a, a background of farming where your parents or grandparents or somebody in your family farms? Anybody? Anybody here? No? Bunch of city folk, I guess. <laughs> All right. Uh, who here has thought about soils before, ever? Maybe a couple people have given it a little bit of thought. I know there's at least a few here, students that have thought about soils. So obviously I'm biased, but I think soils are really cool. Uh, I also think that they're probably one of the most important and overlooked uh, elements of ag agro ecosystems or agriculture. Uh, it's really hard because we don't often notice what's beneath our feet and it's hard to see what's beneath our feet. Soils are opaque, which makes them very difficult to study, as you can imagine. Um, it's coming, I think. We'll see. <laughs> Fingers crossed. All right, well, I'm going to... All right, I'm just going to go ahead. Um, so there were some, some images that I wanted to show you that, that helped to describe a little bit about how we define soil health and how we determine if a soil is healthy. And basically the idea is that soils provide a set of services. And whether or not the soils are providing those services will help to us to understand if they're healthy or not. And so we think about soils providing the service of supporting plant growth, and in particular in agriculture, right, that, that leads to yields of crops, um, the food that we eat. But also there's a lot of other really important services that soils provide. Um, they help to mediate pollution. Um, they help to store water. Um, there's also just sort of intrinsic benefits to our own human health because they support all of our natural systems. Um, natural grasslands and forests and so forth. So soils are really important for a lot of different reasons, not just 
to grow crops, although obviously that is one of the main reasons that I'm talking about soils today, is because of their importance for agriculture. Uh, let me just give them here another minute and see if they can get this up. Um, okay. So there are a couple really important cornerstones to soil health. Uh, there are two main factors that go into determining whether a soil is healthy or not. The first is, of course, the biota, the biology. Uh, one of the reasons that we, we talk about soils as having, uh, being healthy or not is because there is so much living in a soil. Soil is teeming with life. The other factor that's really important is the base of that food chain, that food web that supports all of that life, and that's soil organic matter. And so what I wanted to do today a little bit is talk a little bit about soil organic matter. Um, oh, here's the presentation. Can you put it in presentation mode in the view? There we go. All right. So we've already done the definition, so let's skip ahead. So healthy soil, um, these are, this is kind of a list here of some of the really important um, elements of a healthy soil, some of the services I talked about. So cycling of nutrients, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. Storing carbon is a really important uh, function of soils, and that becomes more and more important as we talk about climate change. Providing good aeration to promote root growth and improves uh, resiliency and profitability. So a healthy soil um, improves the resiliency of the system. So in the face of climate change, when we have droughts or flooding, um, improved water storage and reducing disease and pest problems. So a, a healthy soil is going to help reduce the prevalence of pests and disease. Good. All right, so these are the, this is the picture, one of them that I wanted to show you and, and hope to, for you to see, um, is talking about what is soil health in sort of these different levels. And so what I wanted to show you was that we have this idea of soil fertility, which is thinking about mostly the nutrients that are needed to support crop growth. Um, here we have this idea of soil quality. Soil quality is really the, the quantitative aspects of soil. How much sand, silt, and clay is in a soil? What is the soil's pH? So these are very basic physical and chemical properties that we can measure that are pretty straightforward. And yes, they are a component of soil health, but that's once we get outside of that soil quality circle here, then we start to get into an area that's a little bit more esoteric, right? It's a little bit harder to define. And then on the outside is soil security. And so you can see we also have these relatively different functions um, and services and then primary stakeholders as we think about soil health. You can go to the next. And so when we think about services of a soil health across a landscape, I, min I mentioned that soils can help protect us against pollutants and toxins. Um, soils do a very good job of making these uh, substances inert, and a lot of that is either because of the mineralogy or because of the biology. Uh, we also have crop production, of course, but biodiversity. Soils support all of our plant biodiversity. Um, there's also important cultural aspects, building aspects, and then surface water and water pollution or water um, quality is also linked closely to soils. You can go ahead. All right, um, I don't think you're going to be able to read any of this slide, so let's skip that one. It's too far away. <laughs> okay, so again, building a healthy soil, what is it? What are the components? What are the most important pieces? And so we talk about, um, I mentioned, of course, the biota, and then the soil organic matter. And I want to talk a little bit about soil organic matter uh, because it is really the foundation on which a healthy soil is built. Um, you can go to the next. So... Soil organic matter stores the carbon that's in soils, right? So soil, it's organic matter, so obviously there's carbon. 50% of soil organic matter is carbon. 
So if you're building soil organic matter to make your soil healthy, you're also sequestering carbon. Right? Um, it's a nutrient reservoir. Soil organic matter has organic phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen, um, all of the nutrients that plants need. It supports our biological activity. So as I said, it's the base of that food web or food chain. And then we have, it increases uh, water holding capacity. It helps build soil structure, which helps with water infiltration um, and aeration. It also uh, helps to regulate soil pH and it increases ion exchange capacity, meaning that there are nutrients that are held on to better if there's soil organic matter around than if there's not. You can go on. So overall, soil organic matter is really a factor that helps to determine whether or not a soil can provide the water and nutrients that a plant needs to grow. So it really is this foundation, this building block that we're starting with. So if we look at where does soil organic matter come from then, we sort of have this kind of causality loop, uh, sort of a chicken and egg situation, right? Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Um, the same thing can be said about soil organic matter. Which comes first, the microbes or the soil organic matter? Because what we know now and what has been discovered just recently in the last couple decades is that most of soil organic matter is actually built from dead microbial bodies, right? So dead bacteria and dead dead fungi. So there's this really tight relationship between soil organic matter and microbial biomass, and that's really all I'm showing in these two graphs, is that correlative um, relationship. You can go to the next. And so there's this relationship with microbes and soil organic matter where microbes mine soil organic matter to get the nutrients that they need, but then also as that biomass, that microbial biomass turns over and dies, then they're actually contributing to soil organic matter. You can go to the next. So this is a, a scanning electron uh, micrograph, and I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is actually a lysed bacterial cell, and you can see most of its constituents have already um, come out of it, but you can see that it's starting to absorb on this mineral surface right here. And there was a famous soil scientist that said that um, the microbial biomass is the eye of the needle through which all organic matter must pass. So even organic matter, maybe that soil organic matter that is not directly from a microbe, has been processed by a microbe at some point. Um, the other really important factor is how this soil organic matter is protected. Now, microbes can pretty much eat anything. If you can imagine, they've been on this planet for billions of years. There is not an energy generating process out there chemically that they can't take advantage of. They use all kinds of different electron donors and electron acceptors, pretty much everything that you can possibly imagine. And so you can think that any organic matter that's in a system is fair game and they will eat it if the conditions are right. And so one of the really important ways that organic matter is protected that the biology also contributes to is through the formation of soil aggregates. And I just have that pictured here, but really all I wanted to see you, for you to see is that aggregates are formed and soil particles pulled together by fungal hyphae. So the fungi help with that. And then the bacteria, they produce these sticky polysaccharide compounds that also stick soil particles together. Go ahead. Okay. So now I want to get into a little bit more of what my uh, main focus is, and that's the biology and what's going on in these soils. For, for a lot of you, when you think about biology and you think about life, um, you tend to think about humans or you think about, if you think about microbes, you think about them as, as diseases. Um, and so I want to introduce you to all of this life that's going on uh, beneath our feet that you don't s really see on a day-to-day -day basis. So I want to start with soil. And uh, it's hard to see uh, up here, but I have a ruler. And what I have there are two aggregates. Each one is about a centimeter in diameter. And those two aggregates together weigh one gram. So that's one gram of soil. And so then I ask the question, how many bacterial cells how many fungal cells? How much life is there in that one gram of soil? Go ahead. All right, so let's start with the bacteria. So maybe in that single gram, we could easily have a billion bacterial cells. Um, unfortunately, of that billion, only about 1% are culturable. 
meaning we can only grow about 1% of those bacteria in the lab. So that's why DNA methods that we have now where we can do sequencing, that's why that's so important. The only way that we know there's so much diversity in these soils and that there's so much life and so many functions going on is because we've been able to extract the DNA and sequence and see what genes and what functions are there. Um, if we think about bacterial species, I have greater than 10,000, but 10,000 is definitely low. Uh, when I extract, when we extract DNA in my lab and then we send it off for metagenomic sequencing um, and we take a look at all of the diversity that's there, we usually extract about a quarter gram of soil. And if we get anything less than 50,000 different um, operational taxonomic units, um, species kind of breaks down that idea with bacteria, but if we get anything less than 50,000, it's very rare. And we can get a lot more in that single, uh, again, a quarter gram, not even a full gram of soil. And so when we think about fungi, fungi are also uh, really abundant, and in fact, they make up most of the microbial or microorganism biomass in a soil. And we can have 5,000 to a million cells, or we can have up to 20 meters of fungal hyphae in a single gram of soil. Um, we know that there's about 4,000 fungal genera, maybe 50,000 known species. I'm going to talk a little bit about, just briefly, about biodiversity at the end. So we've got a lot of fungi in soil. So if you go into a forest system, um, even around here, you lift up some leaf litter and you see these kind of white uh, stringy looking things, those are fungal hyphae, okay? And in particular, those are what we call white rot fungi and they do a very good job of decomposing all that leaf litter and wood litter in a forest. You can go ahead. You can go ahead. All right, now we're gonna get up to some organisms maybe you haven't heard of or thought about before. Um, we're gonna talk about some other microorganisms, what we call these microfauna. So um, I have pictures here of an amoeba and a nematode on this slide. Uh, we kind of loosely categorize this one group as protozoa. Uh, I say loosely because they're not actually evolutionarily related on the tree of life, but we kind of group them together because they, uh, they move around in similar ways um, and they're similar size. So let's go on to the next. Okay, uh, the next size up, uh, we have what we call meso and macrofauna. So we're just getting a little bit bigger. We have things like mites. Now I have a bunch of pictures of mites here on this uh, bottom slide. Mites are, uh, occupy lots of different niches all over the world. Um, they live on our faces. If you were to take a piece of scotch tape on your face, and then pull it off and look at it under the microscope, you would find skin mites there. Um, they live on our face and they feed off of the bacteria that are in our hair follicle holes that feed off of the oil there. So you've got a whole ecosystem on your face. Um, we also have things that are a bit bigger like spiders and centipedes and millipedes and so forth. And then hundreds of different species and we can have you know, a quarter of a million per square meter of these um, particularly these microarthropods. <coughs> All right, so I just want to go into a little bit more detail about these organisms because these are really the, the organisms that drive everything in a soil and really are responsible to, for soil health. So let's start with these microorganisms. And when I say micro, um, I mean things that are up to maybe about 64 microns um, in diameter or length, things that we really need a microscope to be able to see. You can go ahead. Okay, so we talk about bacteria. And we all have heard about bacteria. Um, they're what we call prokaryotes, meaning that they are single-celled organisms um, that don't have any membrane-bound organelles. Um, first life on Earth are generally only a few microns in diameter. And then we have the archaea. The archaea are another form of single-celled organism. They're also prokaryotes. We know them mostly as extremophiles. They can live in mine drainage that's acidic down to pH of two. They can live in hot springs um, at near boiling point temperatures. And then we have the fungi. They're eukaryotes. They're actually pretty re closely related to us, um, very closely related to us when you compare that to bacteria. And then there's viruses. 
and we're just starting to learn about viruses and archaea. So archaea we've known about for a while. Um, they're the newest kingdom of life on our planet that we've discovered, but we still don't really know all that much about what they're doing in soils. Viruses, the same. We know that viruses, viral loads in soils are extremely high. Every kind of virus that you want to think about or have heard about, you can find it in a soil. Every single organism that we've looked at in soils has viruses that are specific to that in organism. In other words, a virus that can infect that organism. Whether we're talking about bacteria, fungi, uh, the protozoa, the ciliates, the amoeba, so forth. So there's all of these viruses in soils, and we really don't know exactly what they're up to. You can go ahead. Okay, so how many of you have heard about the microbiome? The human microbiome, the plant microbiome. So this is one of the newer fields of study in human health. Um, there's been a lot of really good studies lately that have shown there's a direct connection between our microbiome and our health. Um, if I were to take away right now every single cell from, from your bodies that was you, there would still be uh, an entity sitting in your seat that is composed of all of the microorganisms that are all over and in your bodies, and that is your microbiome. There are many more genes and cells um, that make up who you are that are part of your microbiome and not you. So the human microbiome, again, we have 10 times more microbial cells than human cells and greater than 100 times more genetic material um, than human genetic material. So you can imagine that these guys may have some influence on our health, and indeed they do. Well, if you think about that and you apply that to plants or soils, the same is true. So we think about, yeah. Um, we also have the plant microbiome, and we put this into s several different compartments. You can go ahead. I'm gonna go through this kind of quick. Uh, we call this the phytobiome. Um, if, if you have any interest in that uh, field of study, there's lots of information on it, so I'm just going to kind of skip ahead here. Um, but obviously, there, is, there are big implications. We think about the microbiome in our health. There's big implications about the microbiome for plant health, but also for soil health, right? So we just talked about how many millions and billions of cells and species all of these microbes um, are in the soils, and so they have a big control on soil health. Uh, you can skip ahead. Uh, you can skip it too. And you can skip that too. And okay, so <laughs> just skipping ahead a little bit. Um, so bacteria and archaea, one thing I did want to just stop on here really quickly is to talk about how dominant these forms of life are on our planet. Um, when we talk about the abundance we're talking about 10 to the 30th number of cells. So that's uh, 10 with 30 zeros. Uh, if we talk about all of the biomass carbon on Earth, so all of the living biomass, all of that carbon, 50 to 75% of that is found in bacteria and archaea. Okay, so they are by far the majority of life on our planet. And 90% of all of the nitrogen and phosphorus that you find in a living organism is in a bacteria or archaea. Okay, so they are very dominant on our planet. Uh, you notice there's this 50 to 75 percent of the Earth's biomass carbon. Um, that number, it, that spread is pretty big because we don't really understand how many microbes live in the subsurface. So that's down deep. All we know is that anytime we've gone into any kind of cave or dug a mine shaft down as far as we want to go, we find microbes. So they're there, we just don't have a really good idea about how many. Go ahead. Okay, so I want to go up a little bit in size. I want to talk a little bit more about nematodes and protozoa. So these guys are a little bit bigger than bacteria and fungi. Um, they're what we call fauna, and they are predators. Okay, so if we think about soils as uh, like an African, you know, savanna system, uh, we have our grass that would be like soil organic matter, and then we have those that graze on that grass, which would be our bacteria and fungi, and then we have those that are going to, those bacteria and fungi that are like gazelles or zebra, when we have predators, right? So things that would be like lions or hyenas in a grassland savanna here 
are going to be our protozoa and our nematodes. So we start with protozoa. These are single cell organisms. They're 10 to 52 microns in size. And there's some important groups here, ciliates, amoeba, and flagellates. And we just group them based on how they move and how they get around. You can go ahead. Another really, really important predator are nematodes. Um, most of my students back in the States when I teach soil biology, they know about nematodes because they're really important plant pests and cause plant diseases. But there are nematodes in the soil that are also really important um, because they eat fungi and bacteria. And that's critical because, as I said, a lot of soil organic matter is formed from dead microbial biomass. So we get that as these guys are eaten and then excreted, the excess. But perhaps even more importantly is that when a nematode, for example, eats bacteria, that bacteria has a lot more nitrogen in its biomass than the nematode needs. And so the nematode is going to excrete that excess nitrogen, which is then plant available. Okay, so if we want to make sure that nutrients are cycling and turning over, that's again is part of a healthy soil. Those nutrients are not going to cycle and turn over and be plant available unless we have all of these trophic levels. So we have to have the predator and the prey. Uh, you can go ahead. All right, I want to go up to the next size, and mostly what I'm going to talk about here are microarthropods because they are very abundant in soils, and they're also really critical um, factors in soil health, and they often get overlooked. So the first one I want to come back to is the mites. Uh, I, I mentioned that these mites, they occupy pretty much every habitable niche on our planet, and they also um, are at a bunch of different trophic levels. So we have things like orobatid mites, which help with decomposing litter. They shred it down into little pieces that gives it more surface area. So bacteria and fungi can colonize it and then decompose it further. Um, and then we also have a lot of predator mites that, again, help to turn over nutrients and also can be used as biocontrols to help control pests um, in cropping systems. Most of these mites are microscopic, so they're hard to see without a microscope. I also wanted to just touch on another uh, very abundant group, which are the springtails, or the columbola. And these guys, again, they are in every biome on our planet. You can find them everywhere. They're pretty small, but actually most springtails, a lot of them you can see with the naked eye. Um, you don't necessarily need a microscope. What's interesting about springtails is um, they have this thing called a furcula, which is their springtail, um, that they use to jump. Uh, to get away from predators. And their jumping is the equivalent of a human being jumping over the Eiffel Tower. Um, so they, there's some really cool YouTube videos if you're interested of springtails and their, and their leaping ability. But they feed on fungi, so they're turning over that fungal biomass, and they can also help with decomposing by eating um, plant residues. Go ahead. Um, another one that I wanted to mention are uh, potworms. These are little, little tiny worms. They're very, very much smaller than our earthworms. And I don't know if you can see it here, but that's the earthworm. And this little tiny thing is the potworm sitting on top of the earthworm. So very, very small little worms. But they ingest soils and soil organic matter and all the microbes that might be there. And then they excrete excess nutrients that they don't need. So important for nutrient cycling. All right, I'm going to go one last, the large group here on the end. Um, these are things that are very large, like ecosystem engineer types. Um, the ones that we usually talk about, things like pill bugs and millipedes, um, earthworms, of course. Uh, we've got centipedes and spiders and ants and termites. And I like to show this example. You think about ecosystem engineers and things that really move stuff around and make their own habitat. I don't know if you guys can see this, but they're excavating an ant colony here that they have pumped concrete in. So all of these channels and all of these galleries, this is all built by the ants. And they're just ex excavating it so you can see it. Um, this is actually. Um, a piece of art. There's an artist that injects resin into ant colonies and lets it harden and then digs it out. And you can see all of that 
empty space that was there, that's soil that's been moved. So in the United States, um, in the south, we have what's called fire ants. And in, a, in our state of Georgia, those fire ants can turn over the top two to three meters of soil uh, every 10 years for the whole state. Okay, so a lot of, lot of soil movement by what we call these ecosystem engineers. All right, so the last thing I wanted to do is just touch really quickly on biodiversity. Um, because I've mentioned it a few times, and there is this really strong and direct connection between soil health and diversity. If you lose some of these groups or some of these species that are so critical for maintaining soil health, um, it, it can become a real problem. And unfortunately, in our intensive agricultural systems, we do tend to lose a lot of these organisms, uh, a lot of fungi, and then a lot of these higher trophic levels. Um, one of the other things that, that makes it really difficult to define and study soil health is we actually don't know the extent of the diversity of all of these organisms very well. And so that's, this slide here is just meant to highlight our ignorance. Um, so if we look and we think about vascular plants, all right, we can see those, right? We can go and discover them. We can see them. We know there's 350,000, um, about 351,000 species. There's estimated to be about 400,000, so we've described maybe 88, 90% of all of the plant species on our planet. <coughs> okay, so we've done pretty good. Now we start looking at these things that live in the soils. Um, you can take a look maybe over here at the percent described, I think is most instructive. We think about earthworms, 23%. Ants, 50%. We think about those mites, 55%. And those springtails, those columbula, we've only described and know about 17% of the total species on the planet. Uh, nematodes and these protozoa, nematodes 0 0.2 to 2.5% we know about. The protozoa, 0 0.03 to 0.3. Fungi, we do a little bit better because, of course, fungi produce fruiting bodies called mushrooms that we can see. So that makes it a little bit easier on us. And then we get down to bacteria. It's really hard to know. <laughs> it's less than 5% um, of the species that have been described. Okay. So if you're looking for a field of study that desperately needs people, <laughs> if you're interested at all in nematodes or protozoa, um, we really know very little about these really, really critical and important organisms in soils. Um, if you're wondering how we know what we don't know, we, we can create species area curves or species rarefaction curves to estimate uh, how many species there actually would be. All right. So I'm going to wrap up here uh, with five things that I think are really critical and important services provided by uh, a soil and their connection to microbes in particular. Uh, can you go back one? Skip the first one. Yeah. So the first one is that I talked about already is microbes actually manufacture soil organic matter. So if we want to sequester carbon in the soils and we want to build soil organic matter to improve soil health and sustainability, we have to think about the microbes. You can go to the next. The second one is that microbes also build binding agents that help in the formation of aggregates. Aggregates are so important because they help to protect soil organic matter from being broken down further, and so helping to protect soil carbon so it can be sequestered. Um, it's also critical because it helps with soil structure, which we need for water infiltration, so water doesn't pool on the surface, that it actually flows down into the system, and also for aeration right, because we need gas exchange in our soils. You can go ahead. Microbes make free nitrogen fertilizer. I didn't talk about this today, but bacteria produce an enzyme called nitrogenase that is the only enzyme on the planet that can break apart dinitrogen gas, which is held together by a triple bond, and turn it into ammonia that can then be used to make proteins or other parts of biomass. Okay. There's no other, no other organisms on the planet that can do that, only bacteria, and only a certain kind of bacteria. When we do it, we have to use an industrial process that takes a ton of energy, 900 degrees Celsius, and a bunch of chemicals. Go ahead. 
Um, I also mentioned briefly that diverse microbial communities and a diverse soil community can help prevent um, pests and pathogens, right? So if you have a really diverse community of microbes, in particular fungi and bacteria, then no one organism can really take over, and that means no one disease. So no one bacteria, no one fungi can really take over um, and become a real problem. We also have a lot of sort of natural pest control and a lot of natural biological control. And just a couple kind of cool things. Um, this ring structure here is actually part of a fungal hyphae. And there's actually a fungi that eats nematodes. And so this fungi creates these rings. When it senses a nematode, it snaps it closed. And then it digests that nematode. Um, here we have one species of fungi, trichoderma, that's actually strangling out another species of fungi called rhizoctonia, which is a plant pathogen. So lots of interesting biocontrol um, possibilities so that we don't have to use as many uh, chemicals, but still very unexplored. Um, a lot of these organisms we don't well enough, know well enough to even know if we could use them or not. And then finally, um, microbes make plants healthier. And so there's a lot of these organisms that we can add into plant systems that makes the plant healthier. There's a very close um, and symbiotic relationship between plants and mycorrhizal fungi, for example. But there's also plant growth promoting bacteria that do a really good job of helping plants to grow, even in situations where you might have a pathogen. So here we have a plant growth promoting bacteria growing on a plate. And you can see even though there's a disease introduced to this plant, it's much healthier here than without that bacteria. Um, same thing with the mycorrhizae. When you have a mycorrhizal inoculum, uh, you can see that these roots are much bigger and much healthier with that mycorrhizal um, associate. Go ahead. All right, so I'm going to end there. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but I'm not going anywhere, so I can take questions if, if you guys want to stick around. Uh, but that's all I have for you today. Anybody have any questions? Okay, so the question is, identify micro, macro fauna that are indicators of soil quality, soil health. Um, there have been some attempts to use um, community composition of some of these organisms as indicators. Uh, nematodes in particular, there's a, a soil quality index that you can come up with when you identify nematodes that are plant pathogens versus those that are omnivores or bactivorous that eat bacteria or those that are eating fungi. And when you look at that composition, it can tell you something about um, the health of your soil, although nematodes are tough to identify, so it's not a very practical metric. I can tell you that any system that has been disturbed or is undergoing any kind of intensive agriculture has um, so many less fauna particularly microfauna, and so much less diversity, it's, it's pretty obvious. So if you were to compare any kind of a, an ag field to maybe something adjacent that was somewhat undisturbed, you'd see a huge difference. So just having them there in general is a pretty good indicator. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Madam, uh, my name is Sanjay Rode. I'm uh, just uh, focusing on uh, commercialization of this soil or land. A lot of farmers, they are uh, using uh, so many pesticides and insecticides, and they are creating problem for this fertile soil. Even in Mumbai city also, you'll find, if you take a sample, the soil is uh, really not that quality, and it's affecting on human health also. Mm -hmm. So what is your aspect on that? Yeah, that's, that's a big issue. Um, a lot of the, the pesticides that we apply 
um, are not really very specific to the pests, and so we end up killing a lot of things in the soils that we want to keep. Most fungicides are not specific, and so we do see pretty dramatic declines in fungi, particularly mycorrhizae in, in ag systems, not just because of the tillage, but also the, the chemical applications. I think there's a potential for a lot of a lot of organisms to be good biocontrol agents. There are some examples. Um, there have been some nematodes that are, um, you know, that attack weevils, for example. Uh, we have a product in the United States that's called a nema globe, and it's just a, uh, this round globe that you get that has nematodes that attack very specific weevils in the soil to get rid of beetle pests. Um, and I think, but I think there's other potential. There's uh, mites that you can get that are predatory mites that will attack spider mites that cause uh, pest issues. Um, there was, on, on one of these slides I, sh I showed, there's something called a vampire amoeba that actually, this amoeba produces a little stylet that pokes into pathogenic fungi and basically into their hyphae and then sucks out the insides. And I mean, I think if we knew something about that and could grow it, it would be a great biocontrol agent. Um, I just think that we, we lack a lot of people studying some of these things. Um, I think there's potential out there that we could get rid of some of the chemicals. That being said, if we can manage our soils better to be healthier and to be more diverse, that in and of itself is a way to control pests and pathogens without chemicals. So. Any, any other? Yeah, there was one back here. Two questions actually. The first one being we discussed the microbiome. So if I'm using repetitive uh, bacteria or microbes and uh, giving them to the soil, does it affect the microbiome of the soil over a period of time, like pesticides, insecticides? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I've done quite a bit of looking in the literature. And for just about any chemical that I've ever looked at, that we've added to soils in any way, shape, or form has an impact on the soil biota, and in particular the microbiome quite a bit. So yes, everything that we add has an impact. And then the question is, well, how long is that impact? Does the community come back? Is it resilient? Or does it come back different? So for example, if we apply a fungicide and we're meaning to spray it just on, as a foliar spray, just on the plant, a lot of that's going to end up down in, in the soil, right? So we're killing fungi in the soil. And the studies that I've seen, even just long-term studies, suggest that the fungal community that comes back after that is different. So we've changed it. And then the question becomes, okay, well, we've changed the community. Have we changed the function? So there's still a lot of questions around that. But yeah, uh, fertilizers, nitrogen addition, phosphorus addition changes the communities dramatically. Um, everything that we add. Herbicides have a huge impact on microbial communities. Um, I've seen some papers with big impacts of herbicides on earthworms. So lots of impacts, unintended consequences of all of the chemicals that we use. And still a lot of study that needs to be done to better understand that. You had a second question? Yeah. Uh, there are many different techniques available uh, in, the science, in science today, like hydroponics for growing plants. So if given an option, which one should we prefer now? Should we go back to soil, or should we move forward with these techniques for future productions? Mm. Well, I don't really know all that much about hydroponics, but I know that um, it's expensive and difficult to maintain hydroponic systems cleanly because they, they can get bacteria growth that's not so good in them. Um, I don't think it's a solution for any large scale production. So high value crops, I think there are certain situations um, where hydroponics could work. And if you can keep the system clean, um, I know there's some really good microbial products that work well in hydroponic systems. Um, water systems, they're easier to manage uh, that way compared to soils because you can start out pretty clean. Um, but yeah, I think there's probably a place for hydroponics, but it's not going to replace agriculture in the soil, <laughs> for sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? No? All right, well, um, it's fine. You don't have to ask in front of everybody. If you have any other questions at all, um, I'm going to stick around here for a while. You can come up and just ask me. 
um, that's fine. I'll be here. I'm, I don't have anywhere to go for the rest of the day, I don't think. So <laughs> I'm just going to hang around. So if you have any questions, just come on up. But otherwise, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for a wonderful lecture. I wanted to ask you two questions, but anyways, we'll have it later. I just want to ask from a student's point of view, because a lot of undergraduates, like if they want to take up soil scientists or to become, what could be their post-graduation which they should take or what kind of skill sets they should develop? If you could. Yeah, I that's a good place to start and then if you're interested in soils you can go into a soils program you know for a master's or a PhD I, I would say that the majority of students that have come in to get a master's or PhD in my lab um, I think out of all of the students that I've had uh, I think only two actually had a bachelor's degree in soil science before they came to my lab so I've had um, a geology person, I had somebody that came in with a dual degree in uh, pharmaceutical sciences and biochemistry. Um, I had somebody come into my lab uh, with a degree in ecology and evolutionary biology, which is my original degree um, that I have for my PhD. So I think that you can, any, any of the hard sciences, um, if you decide you want to go into a career in soil science, uh, you can make that transition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. May I request Dr. Suganda Shete, Associate Professor, Department of Chemistry, Kajor Sumer Science and Commerce, to felicitate our speaker today. Thank you, Dr. Sukhanta. I request Dr. Abhishek Chai, Department of Biotechnology, to please give the vote of thanks. Good evening, one and all. Uh, first of all, I'll thank you, ma'am, for giving me an opportunity to give a vote of thanks for such an important talk on agricultural sustainability. And who better to talk on it than Professor Lisa Demon? Now, I have a lot of my students waiting there, and they've already heard about you a lot. And by now you know why, just a small glimpse of this discussion, you know that how thorough and thought-provoking it is to see her work. Okay, I have witnessed that. And the systems which we seldom look into in depth, that's what the work is going on. Right? Uh, rather when we say, the first step of knowledge is knowing what you don't know. I guess you have known that today. All right, so I'm sure she has given you the perception that is required when you want to initiate your research in future. On behalf of everyone present here, I would like to thank you, ma'am, and as well as on behalf of Somaya Vidyavihar University, we would like to thank you for taking your time out from Michigan State University out here and giving us this public lecture. Your words were indeed very inspiring to all my students and the researchers who want to develop. It is a valuable lecture, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you all of you for being present here for the Somaya Public Lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abhishek. Um, soil is a living entity. That is something that I think she has thrown light on it. It's also a, bit, it's a, lot, it's a community which integrates and works together. Nothing works in silos. It is a community building. You saw a kind of community building here today as well. So just to add on to what Abhishek said, I need to thank two more people. I would like to specifically thank Dr. 
Veena Salvi for saving the day, <laughs> and also Dr. Abhishek Chaya for technically saving the day. Thank you so much, audience, for being very patient when there was a technical glitch. And also, I heartfelt thanks and apologies for the technical glitch. But she was took it in a sport, and uh, you know, she was delivering the lecture without the PowerPoint slides. That's that's a true testament of a researcher and a teacher. Thank you all so much. Have a great year ahead. Just last parting words. I will leave you with this uh, powerful quote by Mahatma Gandhi: "To forget how to dig the earth." And to tend the soil is to forget ourselves. Wishing you all the very best. Have a great, sustainable, filled year ahead. Bye. Thank you.